So, Sebastian, maybe we we'll start? Sure. Yeah. All right. It's a, an immense pleasure to introduce Sebastian Torres from ICMS, who is going to tell us about Windows and BGM and conjecture. Sebastian? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So uh, let me tell you about this, uh, which, by the way, it's a joint work with Jenia Tevelev, my advisor, my PhD at UMass. So uh, to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give a brief uh, description of what derived categories are very roughly, uh, and motivation, uh, what the, this conjecture I'm talking about is about. Uh, and then I need to to discuss the, the, the main tools that we're going to be using, which have to do with the tools of Windows and uh, GIT, how, they, how Windows um, describe drive categories of GIT quotients. Uh, so I'll explain about that later. And then, well, uh, I, will, I will use, uh, I, I, will, I will do the, the last two things, which will be uh, get, getting to the proof of the, of the result that I'm, that I'm talking about. So, um, okay, what is a drive category? Um, well, I will be working over C, even though some of the things that I will be saying actually work on other fields, but let's just fix the complex numbers as a field. So I have an algebraic variety and, and most of the times it's gonna be uh, something smooth uh, for us or uh, projective. And the drive category basically is uh, you want to have not just coherent sheaves, but actually chain complexes of coherent sheaves. So you have uh, Fi, uh, Fi plus one, and then there's a connecting map uh, between uh, two consecutive ones uh, whose composition is zero. And uh, well, it's not just that. Uh, in order to find the drive category, you need to impose that if you have a quasi isomorphism in the drive category, it becomes an isomorphism. So you sort of localize it at those uh, quasi-isomorphisms, meaning that you um, make up uh, inverses for those. So that's really roughly what it is. Um, uh, and uh, one of the most important features uh, that uh, of this red category is that it's a triangulated category, meaning that it has something called um, uh, exact triangles, uh, which uh, are kind of an analogous of what it would be a uh, short exact sequence. So if you have a short exact sequence in uh, the uh, in the uh, in, in, in coherent sheaves, uh, then or quasi coherent sheaves for that matter, then uh, that will become a, a an, an exact triangle uh, where where you have to put um, uh, you know the, the the same terms, but then you have to shift the previous one by one and, and so on. Uh, by the way, triangulated category also means that you have a, a shift. I mean, uh, you have a notion of shift, which means, well, nothing but just rename these numbers i, i plus one, you know, shifted by one. So that's uh, roughly what it is. Uh, and also another important feature is that if you have a morphism between algebraic varieties, um, well, you have push forward, you have a, a pullback and so on. And then uh, if you, you have those between sheaves, and now we want to define those between uh, derived categories, and those are the derived functors. There is such thing as right derived functor of the push forward, left derived functor of the pullback, also uh, the derived functor of the functor of global sections. Uh, and in a way, derived categories are this natural home, natural framework for defining derived functors. So, that's kind of the whole point of defining this kind of object. And uh, I mentioned the derived functor of the global sections. That's nothing but uh, the sheaf cohomology. So uh, this is actually how you define sheaf cohomology. And again, uh, the way you define sheaf cohomology in general would be you have to resolve your sheaf by a, a, you know, a, a complex, a chain complex of uh, uh, injective sheaves, uh, and that's nothing but uh, talking about chain complexes, meaning you're talking about uh, uh, an object in the derived category, which by the way is quasi-isomorphic to, to your sheaf, um, right? Uh, in other words, isomorphic, because we said that quasi-isomorphisms become, become isomorphisms. So, that, so that's kind of the whole point. Um, okay, so a few key facts about drive categories uh, that you can get by with uh, 
uh, without resorting to the whole theory, is that if you have a short exact sequence and, and coherent shifts, uh, then you get uh, a long exact sequence in cohomology. That's, uh, that's the, the whole point of defining this. Uh, also, uh, when if you have sheaves and uh, just sheaves, not not a complex sheaf, you can still see them as a as a chain complex uh, just by saying that everything else is zero. And if you want to know what what are the morphisms in the derived category, well, they are nothing but the x functors, because of course x are defined in terms of resolutions, so it it it's not that. Uh, difficult to convince yourself that this is the case. So when you talk about HOM here, it's really Xed in, in, in the old language. And uh, if you think about what would happen if you choose one of those to be just the structure sheaf, well, you're just talking about sheaf cohomology. That's, that's what it is. Um, so uh, we are interested in, uh, in uh, finding decompositions of a drop category. You want to... Um, uh, you want to break it into pieces, into simpler pieces, we, and that will, we will call a semi-orthogonal decomposition. The same way if you have a vector space, maybe you would want a basis for your vector space, although it's a really rough analogy because uh, uh, you won't find really like a basis of one-dimensional spaces in this case. But, but, you, but you want to build, uh, build your category up from uh, blocks, from blocks. And then we will say that you have a semi-orthogonal decomposition where when you have a bunch of admissible subcategories, which, well, uh, it, it means that uh, e the inclusion is, uh, it has, an, has an adjoint, has an adjoint from both sides. Uh, and, and by the way, these categories better be uh, uh, full, full triangulated subcategories themselves. But okay, they have to be admissible, which is somewhat technical. What makes, the, what makes it semi-orthogonal is that uh, there should be no morphisms between them, but only from right to left, so it's only semi-orthogonal. And uh, they should generate the whole drive category as a triangulated category. So yeah, we, we, are, we, we are after those decompositions in general. Um, well, uh, some some key facts. Uh, well, drag categories you can think of them as a finer invariant than shift cohomology. So you you don't just remember, uh, you know, just the cohomology of the sheaves, but also actually the entire complex, for instance, entire chain complex. So it's a finer invariant. Uh, as I said, it's the natural home for defining something like derived functors, such as shift cohomology, the the most you know one of the most uh, used ones. Uh, and I guess there's this rough idea that if you know something about uh, the derived category, maybe you should know something about <laughs> the <geometry. laughs> there you go. Sorry, uh, is there a question? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, so if, if you know something about the derived category, maybe you can recover something about uh, X or there are some, uh, uh, you know, Torelli theorems for, uh, for example, Fano varieties or so on. Um, and the idea is to try to understand uh, dbx, so that so that, that should say something in geometry. Applications of this uh, range from you know mirror symmetry uh, to uh, rationality problems uh, or virtual instability conditions. Actually, let me say uh, I, I will say a bit more about uh, rationality problems and this supposed uh, link with uh, how it somehow should show up in in the uh, in the world of derived categories although it's not entirely understood uh, in general but but there, it, there there should be some connection maybe so okay just a few examples uh, the simplest uh, projective uh, variety that you could have is a projective space and it it's been shown uh, it was it has been known classically that its derived category has uh, semi-orthogonal decomposition that looks like this. When I write a vector bundle like this, I mean um, the derived, sorry, the triangulated category generated by this vector bundle. So that means uh, uh, this and all chain complexes that have, uh, you know, sums of this and shifts and so on. So uh, this, I guess, is like the simplest semi-orthogonal decomposition you could have, where each of these uh, subcategories is generated by a vector bundle. 
by a line bundle actually, and um, and, and indeed, um, uh, if you think about it, a, a line bundle or the triangulated subcategory generated by a line bundle is like the derived category of a point. So, so this is like the really you have a basis. This is actually what is called an, an exceptional collection. And if you think about what it means for this to be semi-orthogonal, for example, if you go from right to left, there should be no morphisms. That means there should be no, there should be no X. So for example, from O to O say minus N, there's no X, meaning that this bundle has no cohomology. And, and, and that's true. I mean, that's something that can be computed uh, explicitly. So, so that makes this a semi-orthogonal decomposition. Although, um, uh, it, it's more work to show that to show that uh, it actually generates the whole thing, but uh, well, it can be shown. Uh, a more interesting example is if you intersect two quadrics uh, in uh, in P five, um, so you get a threefold, and uh, it it's a Fano variety, and it has a semi orthogonal decomposition of this shape where you have uh, O of minus one, and then something else, which is uh, turns out to be the derived category category of a curve. And this is not a random curve. You can think of it as, uh, so the way you build this curve, you can think of it as you have this uh, two quadrics, they define a pencil, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, um, a P1 pencil of, of quadrics uh, and, uh, this intersection will be, and uh, in, in this pencil that will there will be, I, th I think, six of them that will be uh, 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 singular. So if you take the two to one cover to uh, P one, so the hyperlytic curve that's a two to one cover ramified in those points, that's C. So that's kind of surprising that you would have such a you know nice structure here uh, of the remaining part. By the way, I didn't say, but if you start with a, with a semi-orthogonal blocks, like for example, I can start with this and this, these two make up two semi-orthogonal blocks to each other. I can always uh, build a semi-orthogonal decomposition where uh, when you define, for example, on the right as another category that you define it to be the, just the orthogonal complement. And in this case, the orthogonal complement to these two turns out to be this uh, direct category of this curve. And uh, maybe uh, another example, uh, if you have a cubic uh, threefold, uh, you also have a similar orthogonal decomposition like this, uh, where you have OX, OX of one, and then the orthogonal complement to it. Uh, it's not something uh, geometric in the sense uh, that it's not the direct category of any smooth projective variety, unlike this previous one. And it should ring a bell, the fact that um, this one is, is rational and this one is not. So uh, I don't know much about this entire approach, but there's this idea, I think, by Kuznetsov that somehow rationality of a variety should show up in the, um, in what, actually what we call the Kuznetsov component. But in, in, in other words, it should show up in the way that this, uh, derived category is split into blocks. So yeah, uh, that, that's a really interesting, um, you know, line of, uh, of, of research. So yeah, there's a question here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And by the way, the way uh, the, the, it's interesting that the way you know that this is not uh, the derived category of any variety is that if it were, it would have to be a Calabi-Yau, but it would have to have fractional dimensions, so that cannot happen, just like a fractional Calabi-Yau. And, uh, well, let me just uh, go back to this example uh, a bit, this Vondal or Law theorem. This is not a random example, because you can also think of this space as uh, the... Um, moduli space of stable bundles of rank two over C. And it has this decomposition where, as I said, you have the derived category of a point, again, the derived category of a point, and then the derived category of the curve. 
So this uh, is not uh, particular to um, a curve of genus two. In fact, uh, you can find more uh, more uh, general uh, results. So that brings us to uh, BGMN conjecture, as, as we are calling it. So um, let me fix a curve of uh, genus uh, at least two. Uh, and uh, let me fix also a line bundle of odd degree. And I'm going to consider the space of stable uh, bundles of rank two over this curve C. And with, with this fixed determinant. Um, so uh, for example, um, you can always embed the drive category of the curve into that of this moduli space. That, that's the, that can always be done. Uh, Fonaryov and Kuznetsov showed it for a general curve. Um, and uh, Narasimhan actually showed it for any curve of genus, at least two. And the way you do it, it's this Fourier Mukai transform uh, given by the universal bundle. So this is an object. So it's a sheaf. It's a coherent sheaf on C times N. It's actually a bundle uh, and on, on the product. And this Fourier Mukai transform, what it does is it takes uh, someone here, pulls it back to the product, tensors with uh, the bundle, and push it, pushes it forward to the space. And that's your Fourier Mukai transform. And it, it turns out that this is a this is an embedding, it, meaning it's a fully faithful functor. And by the way, when I say pull back, push forward, all, all those are, I'm thinking of those as derived functors. Um, yeah, well, and not only that, uh, you can start a semi-orthogonal decomposition like this, where again, you have a bun vector bu uh, line bundle, line bundle, and the curve. So point, point, curve, and then whatever else is left, that's what I'm calling B here, which is the orthogonal complement to that. Um, uh, well, uh, this uh, year, uh, there was this work by Kim Seok Lee uh, together with Nara Simpan, to, who showed that you can actually embed not just C, but the symmetric square of C. Uh, well, there's a condition that uh, it should be non-hyperliptic and of genus at least 16. But uh, again, uh, you have this, um, another uh, fully faithful functor into here. Um, and indeed, uh, you can start a, oops, uh, yeah, you can start a semi-orthogonal decomposition like that uh, when you will have the drag category of a point, a curve, and then the symmetric square, I mean, the curve and symmetric square of the curve, and then uh, whatever is left. Uh, and indeed, again, this is not uh, random. Uh, there was uh, there's this conjecture that says that that should always be the case, not just with points and the curve and the symmetric square, but there should be this uh, semi-orthogonal decomposition for the whole derived category of the space of stable bundles. Uh, given as follows, so there should be two copies of the derived category of the points. So that should be two line bundles that are uh, exceptional. Uh, there should be two copies of the curve, two copies of the symmetric squared, and so on, all the way to G minus two, and then only one copy of the G minus first symmetric square of the curve. So that was uh, conjectured by Narasimhan and also by Belmont, Galkin, and Bukopiadai uh, around the same time, maybe three years ago. Um, and, and of course, all of these results hint to that, uh, to that, uh, so that they, that conjecture uh, should be true. So that they are um, uh, results toward that conjecture. And uh, well, what we showed is the following: uh, we have a semi-orthogonal decomposition where you indeed have all those blocks. So you have these drag category of a point and symmetrics symmetric powers of the curve. So the only difference is that here uh, we have, uh, here I'm calling it A and B. So A are all these blocks and then B will be whatever is left. So the um, uh, orthogonal complement to all of these. So we expect that this should be zero. That would be the BGMN conjecture, but uh, a priori there could be more stuff, but uh, we, we really want to show that this is zero. But we have this, this semi-orthogonal decomposition with these blocks, and then it's orthogonal complement a priori. 
So, uh, I mean, it could be that for some semi orthogonal decompositions, beta is zero, not for all. I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we expect that it should, it should be zero. Uh, it, it, we expect but maybe for mm -hmm. some semi orthogonal decomposition, but maybe there is other way, it's not zero. Well, yeah, but, but the conjecture says that it would be zero. I don't know if, if the conjecture is true or not, but. Mm -hmm. So you are claiming for some semi orthogonal decomposition or for all? Uh, I'm 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 not claiming for anyone. I, I'm not claiming that B is zero. And, and I'm just saying that I mean I know that for genus two is it is zero because that's yeah. one color law. But uh, but I'm not claiming that that is zero in, in anywhere. I'm just saying that we expect that hopefully it will be zero. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that is that is zero ever. Mm -hmm. Although, um, well, well, one thing that's interesting is that uh, there's this paper by Lin by uh, very recently that shows that actually each of these blocks cannot be decomposed further. So this the composition is kind of Jordan Holter, and it's like it can't be split any further at, at, on the A part. B we don't know. Uh, but uh, we expect that B should be zero. Hopefully, uh, that's that's the the entire BGMN conjecture. That that would prove the entire G BGMN conjecture that B, if if we show that B is zero, and uh, there are works that hint toward the fact that uh, B should be zero. There's there in, uh, at least um, on the motivic uh, case. So I think uh, maybe the K theory of this should be zero. So it would have to be some somewhat of like a phantom or something if, if it weren't. Uh, uh, so it would be very surprising, I think, if it were not zero. But we don't know. We don't know a priori. Um, and I, also, I should mention that uh, a little after we, we posted this to the archive, uh, uh, we, we saw this, um, uh, we saw another uh, one posted by Yao and Xu that they proved the, the same result, but with different techniques. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know much about their approach, but uh, it's interesting that uh, they were working on, in the same. So what are, the, what are their techniques? What are, what are their techniques? Uh -huh. I think they work on the, on the whole uh, stack of bundles, and then they try to descend it to the, to the quotient. So without, without, I think, like stable condition, I think, and, and then they build their, uh, yeah, their paper is, is in the archive. It's uh -huh. it, it so up, find. Up like, uh -huh. uh, yeah, like uh, beginning of se September or end mm -hmm. of August. Uh, and, and it's the same, it's the same result. Also, we don't know that, that this is full. It, it, there may be some orthogonal complement to this. We don't know. So yeah, so the techniques that uh, we will be using uh, use uh, windows, uh, which help us understand uh, the derived categories of quotients, namely GIT quotients. So let me give a, a basic background of what GIT quotients are and then how windows apply very roughly. So a GIT quotient is built uh, as follows. So you will have a smooth uh, variety that's let, let's say it will be smooth uh projective or affine for that matter actually it it has to be projective over affines but you can think of projective or affine so you write your variety as a proch of some ring um and then let's say that uh okay let's uh, you have an action so you want to build a quotient of x by g so you have an action of x on of g on x it's a reductive group and then you want to extend the action to the ring. And then, uh, then your GAT quotient will be nothing but uh, the approach of not R, but the, of the invariance. RG is the invariance by G. Uh, that's how you define a GAT quotient. Although, uh, of course, uh, in this process, uh, there's hidden the fact that uh, I'm doing two choices, really. Because uh, there's not a unique way of writing X as proch of a ring. You have to choose a ring, a coordinate ring. That means that you're choosing a polarization, meaning an ampoule line bundle. And also, um, 
uh, you have to choose how a G will act on R because you're extending it to the to to the whole ring, meaning that you 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 have to extend the action from X to L. So the 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 entire you can think of it as the total space of your uh, the bundle that's giving you the polarization. So we will say that L is a G-linearized uh, line bundle or an G-equivariant line bundle. Um, the easiest example would be uh, you have uh, affine space and you act by multiplication by a scalar. The quotient of that, if you choose uh, an interesting linearization, which you can basically choose either a non-interesting or an interesting one. So if you choose an interesting one, uh, that will give you Pn. So that's the quotient of the, um, the GAT quotient of the affine space by this. Um, now, uh, of course, there's no map, like there's no quotient map from AM plus one to Pn, because in order for this to be really an honest quotient, you would have to throw away the the bad points, meaning the origin, because the origin doesn't map to anything in the projective space. So that's your what's called the unstable locus. So, so um, uh, we will call unstable locus the points that you have to throw out, uh, and the semi-stable locus the points that you don't have to throw out, roughly speaking. Um, so those are the points where at least one invariant is not zero. Yeah, so you have this quotient map not from X itself, but from, from the semi-stable locus. And the stable locus will be, well, those uh, whose orbit is closed here and of the right dimension, but let's not worry much about that because uh, I will be interesting in the cases where actually semi-stable and stable locus is the same. Um, uh, in fact, uh, okay, when, when you choose a different linearization, uh, that will give you a different GAT quotient, as I said. Uh, so if you choose a different uh, line bundle or a different uh, action on, uh, on the line bundle, that will give you a different GAT quotient. And there's this uh, beautiful description of how you know, the GAT varies when you, when you, when you move uh, across the space of possible linearizations. And there's the system of walls and chambers where uh, a wall will, would be, um, a space, uh, you know, a, 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 a bunch of linearizations that would give you uh, uh, locus that's, um, you know, uh, strictly semi-stable, so semi-stable but not stable. And uh, at, at either side of a given wall, uh, uh, you will you'll have different chambers, and in the interior of the chamber, uh, we will have uh, these. So I'm interested mostly in the interior of the DAT chambers. So, okay, uh, uh, I won't say uh, much more about uh, the generalities of DAT, but um, let's again uh, consider uh, X, you know, a variety that has this uh, action of G. Uh, and let's say that you have a G equivariant vector bundle, meaning a vector bundle, but with an action of, by, by, by G. So if if G if G were the um, you know C, C star then imagine that C star fixes a point. Well, uh, if C star acts on uh, on the entire uh, you know uh, F in, on the entire total space of F, and it fixes Z, well, it has no choice but to act on the fiber of, of Z. So that's so that's F Z, and uh, it will act by, you, you can always diagonalize this action. It will, it will be like, uh, in the diagonal, it will be T to the D. So these Ds are what we call the weights. So the eigenvalues of this action. Uh, uh, yeah, so we, we will be interested in the weights of a given uh, G equivariant vector bundle when you, uh, when you move, when you change, when you take different, um, one parameter subgroups, meaning uh, C stars inside the, your group. Uh, so yeah, I'll assume that for now that the G will act freely on the semi-stable locus because 
that will be the case in our in the cases that we are interested in. So there's this uh, quantization commutes with reduction theorem that uh, basically says the following. Let's say that uh, you have X and you're trying to think of the uh, GAT quotient of X by G when you have chosen a linearization. So uh, by this dBGX, I mean the G equivariant drive category, meaning I not only want uh, um, sheaves or, or coherent sheaves or, or comp chain complexes of coherent sheaves on X, but also I want to put an action on each of them. So those are, those are uh, G equivariant you know, chain complexes. And uh, I will say, let's say that they restrict to the semi-stable locus uh, to some F and K. Um, so uh, you want to compare, um, you want to compute morphisms uh, between uh, F and K and the GAT quotient. And you want to compare that to the morphisms of uh, the, the, the F and K, but they on the entire thing. And what prevents you from saying that these two things are equal is the fact that um, X with the action of G and the GAT quotient itself, they sort of differ by the unstable locus. So if you throw away the unstable locus, then you will get basically the GAT quotient, which is uh, X, uh, you know, just the same unstable locus with the action of G. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that G X freely here. So uh, the theorem says the following. So if you have some control of what happens on the unstable locus, then you will be able to say that these two things are equal and you will, will be able to compute the, uh, these morphisms, you will be able to compute them on the whole uh, stack, let's say, uh, on the entire X, including the unstable locus. And, and the condition, I, I won't dig much into it, but uh, the way you do it is uh, you want to, to measure the weights uh, of, the, of your bundles, F and K. So you have to stratify in a particular way your, your unstable locus, that's your campsnet certification. And, uh, and uh, you have to measure the weights. And, and there, there are these numbers, eta, um, that have to do with the weight of the, of, of the equinormal bundle of each of these strata. And, uh, and, and W, you can choose them actually. Uh, so then if, if if the weight of F and K verify this condition, then you, you can compute these, these you can compute here. So, well, I guess in, in uh, the, um, the upshot is that if your right-hand side is easier to compute, uh, then, then that's good because you can compute uh, morphisms uh, downstairs by resorting to, the, to upstairs. And if you want to do a more simple case, uh, if you want to think about this in a simpler way, if you just hear about chief cohomology, what this is saying is that, let's say that you let F to be just the uh, structure sheaf, then this is measure, measuring sheaf cohomology. So sheaf cohomology downstairs can be computed as sheaf cohomology upstairs, which is nothing but uh, sheaf cohomology, and then you take the invariance. That is, as long as uh, the weights condition is satisfied, which I won't say much about, but there is this technical condition. Uh, so you will be able to do this for some uh, bundles or chain complexes for that matter. Um, even more, uh, th th there's way more to, to this analysis. Actually, uh, this is something that, uh, that was shown around the same time by uh, Ballard, Favero, and, and Ludmil. Uh, and, and also by Hal Halpert Leisner, which is, by the way, uh, one person with a hyphenated uh, last name. Um, you can see the entire, the full um, derived category of the GAT quotient. You can see it inside the G equivariant category of your object, of your space upstairs. So, uh, uh, the, 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 this GW here is what I'm calling the, or it's called the window category. And it's, uh, it can be defined as, you know, the bundle, bundles that have weights uh, in a certain range. Um, 
and, uh, and and it restricts. So so th those objects you you see them in in X in in the, in the derived category of X but as G equivariant objects and and X and uh, and if you consider only those objects having these weights and you restrict to the semi-stable locus, that will give you the whole derived category of, uh, of the GAT quotient. And by the way, um, uh, this sits in a semi-orthogonal decomposition uh, and it sits, it sits uh, in a uh, decomposition like this, where, um, well, there, there are these things that you can put to the right and to the left, where, which I'm not defining, but it, these, uh, less or bigger than or equal W have to do with weights. And, and these are things that are supported on the unstable locus only. And by the way, uh, I didn't say what these W, I didn't say much about these W alphas, but these are numbers that you can choose. So what's remarkable here is that this doesn't give you just an embedding, it gives you many embeddings because whatever W you choose, so let's imagine that, uh, that there's only one strata, so there's no alpha. So that would be uh, that would be you you would have to consider the objects that have weight between say W and W plus eta. Whatever W you choose, that will give you a different window category, and all of them are equivalent to uh, the direct category of the quotient. So you could sort of if you have this uh, GW here, you can slide it. If you if you choose a different uh, W, you will you will get uh, another one and it will be a different window. So you can sort of move your window across the, whatever, like the window sill or rail. Uh, and yeah, the, the most, um, the, the easiest example of how this plays out would be again, uh, PN, projective space can be seen as the GAT quotient of the affine space. And on the affine space, what's the, What's the derived category? I'm, I'm interested in the uh, C star equivariant derived category, meaning I, I not only want uh, bundles or, or chain complexes, but I also want those with an action. And uh, if it were just, just if I were concerned only about bundles, there's only one interesting bundle here, which is the structure sheaf. But uh, if I am, if I care about the different ways that you can put an action on that, you have infinitely many of those. In fact, uh, you have you, you can twist the action by one, by two, but by any number in Z actually. So there's an infinite semi-orthogonal decomposition on this derived category of the G equivariant one on X. And if you restrict only to those bundles, say uh, only to, to those that have weights between W and W plus eta, eta happens to be uh, M plus one in this case, then you get the derived category of the projective space. They, they restrict to the derived category of the projective space. And you can see it as uh, O minus N, O minus N plus one, all the way to O. Or uh, actually, but th by that matter, you can, for that matter, you can actually twist by any W and it will still give you the same drive category of PN. So if you change W, it's a different window, but all of them, if you see them here, they are all um, uh, equivalent to the drive category of, of PN. Uh, and, and as I said, also uh, the, the theorems is more, it says that if you wanna see, see it sitting inside the same orthogonal decomposition upstairs, What's left uh, to the right and to the left are these things that are actually um, supported in the unstable locks. This is the, the origin and the affect space. Okay, so uh, uh, one more thing uh, uh, by the same authors, this, the, the theorem says more uh, that actually if you have, if you want to compare now different GT quotients, um, their derived categories are related to each other. So if, if, you, want to, if you want to use that, let's say that, that you have this JT decomposition, so you have different JT quotients, and let's say that both are on different sides of a given wall. So um, for one, for one uh, chamber, uh, you will have one way of building your window category, and for the other one, you will have another way. So if, 
if the window is consistently wider on one side of the wall, then you will be embed, you will be able to embed uh, the derived category of one GAT quotient on into the derived category of the other GAT quotient. So uh, this is the theorem. This theorem. Really, what you need to test is the uh, weights of the uh, of the canonical sheaf uh, on on the wall. And if you if you if these weights are all consistently negative, then uh, then one side of the wall will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, embedded in the other side of the wall. Or if they're consistently positive, it will be the other way around. So, uh, or, or, or if you don't care about the, the entire drive category, actually this, uh, for example, if you only think of fully faithfulness, this would be saying that if the weights are uh, correct, uh, or, or what you want, then maybe, um, morphisms here can be computed as morphisms here and then they will be the same. Um, so uh, an example of this is let's again, let's have the affine space, but instead of uh, scalar multiplication acting just by multiplication, I'm gonna choose weights uh, positive and negative and on, on different coordinates. And uh, you can choose uh, linearizations, uh, that, uh, that that will twist this by uh, one or minus. That will choose the action on the on the structure shift by my, one or minus one, and, and the and what you get is is a flip. Um, if you choose one linearization, you choose uh, some what I'm calling x plus, uh, where you have p n embedded here, and the other one will give you x minus. Uh, we have p m embedded here, and this. Uh, this map, uh, this is a resolution, this blows down one side, this blows down the other side. And what this X zero is what you have on the wall. This is what you would get if you, if you chose a linear system that's exactly on the wall. And that's, uh, that one uh, blows down uh, both. I mean, it collapses both uh, PM and PN uh, to a point, either coming from this or that side. So uh, if you if you want to play the game of windows uh, of the uh, on the drag category of x plus or x minus, well, uh, the, you have to test you know the unstable locus, uh, which is well the unstable locus is the origin, and uh, I, I mean the, the fixed locus, but C star is the origin, and if you choose. Um, one or other linearization that will make the entire unstable locus to be, well, the unstable locus will be what's attracted to the origin and that will be either a M plus one or a M plus one on either side. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 the window uh, um, on, on, on this side will have these weights, on the other side it will have this weights uh, and uh, and if one of them is bigger, well, you have uh, the um, derived category of this one embedded on the derived category of this one. So that's that's how you cross uh, the wall. Uh, so there's this wall, and there's this uh, these windows open uh, a window that that makes um, this these guys uh, cross over to the other side of the wall. Um, okay, so that's the, the background. Actually, I should uh, now start talking about uh, what we are doing because we are interested ultimately in the uh, moduli space of bundles on a curve. So uh, what we will do will be uh, for now not focus directly on that space, but instead uh, on these spaces that Tadeus introduced, which are, well, um, vector bundles on a curve, but not just vector bundles, but uh, uh, pairs pairs of a vector bundle of rank two. Again, I have this curve of genus at least two and, uh, and a section. So I will be a pair of a bundle and a section. And, and uh, depending on a, on a number sigma that I will fix, then the stability condition uh, will be different. So I'm defining the stability condition to be this, depending on whether, uh, for a, for a sub bundle L, uh, there, these uh, inequalities should hold depending on whether phi is 
a section of L or not. Um, and for different sigmas, you will get different stability conditions. You will get different moduli spaces. Um, and well, there's this work by Thaddeus that shows how to construct these moduli spaces. Uh, by the way, I'm fixing the, the determinant to be uh, lambda it's a, of a degree of odd degree. Uh, so yeah, there are these moduli spaces, and there's this uh, you know GIT uh, decomposition and uh, walls and chambers. The chambers are, are M0, M1, M2, and so on, and they fit into this kind of diagram where um, M1 and M2 are related actually by a flip. Uh, and, uh, and interestingly, um, the last uh, chamber is uh, what I'm calling MW, and this carries a map, it's like an Abel Jacobi map, which is like a forgetful map, to N, N is our space. N is the one that we are actually interested in, which is the moduli space of, of uh, vector bundles, uh, not pairs, just vector bundles. So uh, yeah, so there's this diagram and, uh, uh, and uh, these are all rational. These, uh, these are by rational morphisms and this is a blow up and this is projective space. And, and what happens between uh, two, Two of these is is a wall crossing with a GAT uh, actually wall crossing. It, it, there's a flip here uh, happening, um, where it's not exactly the standard flip that we saw, but there there are these um, projective bundles sitting inside each of uh, M i and M i minus one, and and these sort of parameterize those bundles that would be stable here but not here, and vice versa. And, and they are um, vector bundles over the symmetric um, power uh, of a curve, so uh, of the curve. So, so that kind of hints of, uh, toward what we are trying to do, which is at the end, it's uh, embedding the symmetric power of the curve into the direct category of, of the entire space. So, um, I want to analyze what happens if you play this whole Windows game between uh, M between two consecutive GAT chambers in this uh, you know uh, wall and chamber diagram like like this, uh, right? So well, uh, you will be able um, to um, cross the walls as long as uh, well some uh, weights conditions are satisfied. So let's. Uh, Let's consider M i and A M i minus one. They are both quotients of uh, the same space, right? Uh, with two different linearizations that you choose. So uh, if uh, if you want to compute uh, morphisms between two objects A and B, well, um, if the weight conditions are satisfied, then uh, the um, then these morphisms here you can compute it upstairs. And these morphisms here, you can also compute it upstairs as long as conditions are uh, on both sides are satisfied. And that will make uh, the morphisms on the left-hand side equal to the morphisms on the right-hand side. Uh, that, that happens, of course, uh, that, play, that, that game you can play if, if you have objects that, that are defined sort of functorially, meaning that they, they, are, they, they descend from something upstairs, uh, you know? Uh, so if you check some numerical condition, then you will be able to cross the wall. Morphisms here, cross the wall, and, and, and they, they are morphisms here as well. So that will be the, the main tool that we, that we want to use. So in fact, uh, you can prove the following. Um, if I satisfies this numerical condition, um, one side of the wall is entirely embedded into the other side of the wall. So, um, in fact, uh, m i minus one will be uh, the drive category of that will be embedded in that of m i. And not only that, uh, uh, you will, if if you want to write the entire drive category of m i, well, what's missing uh, is a bunch of copies of uh, of this symmetric uh, power of the curve. And the reason uh, why that should be true is. Uh, because it's, th there's this flip diagram where, where what you're missing from one side and the other are these 
bundles precisely over this, uh, you know, symmetric power. So, so that plays a role into why uh, you have this, this decomposition. So yeah, actually I won't uh, use these blocks directly, but um, uh, I, I will want to think of this embedding. So direct category of one of them is embedded into the, the next one. So, well, yeah, let me uh, take you back to this uh, diagram. Um, I said that this is a projective space. This is a blow up. Uh, so let me just say that again. Um, M0 is uh, a projective space. Uh, M1 is a blow up of an embedded copy of the curve itself. Uh, and let's say that uh, the degree of lambda is 2t minus 1, which is odd, of course. Um, so then this last map that, that, that I had on the right-hand side of the, of the board uh, is a birational morphism in this case. Um, and in fact, the um, pullback is fully faithful. So I will be able to embed the drive category of N into the drive category of, of M uh, G minus one. So let's do computations for now on these spaces, M G minus one and actually M I. And at the end, the, the last step will be to use this, uh, you know, uh, embedding of the direct category of n into that of uh, those spaces that I, that I will be dealing with. So, um, yeah, th there is uh, basically one tool for defining functors between direct categories, which is these Fourier Mukai uh, transforms, meaning you have, you, you take uh, an object, uh, I, I, I said this before, you take an object in the product and the derived, uh, sorry, and then and you define this functor to be pull back, tensor, and push forward. Uh, and here, um, I mean, derived pull back, derived tensor, and so, et cetera, between um, the curve and M1. Well, it turns out that this functor is fully faithful. Um, how you show that uh, is uh, as follows. Um, uh, you know, uh, what you need to show by this Orlov, uh, Bondal Orlov criterion, uh, what you need to show is that basically it's fully faithful on um, points, uh, right? Because fully faithful mean that, that means that, you know, uh, amorphisms should be the same, and you can check that only on points. Uh, uh, so, so you need to show this, and uh, that means, um, well, uh, that uh, if you want to think about this um, in terms of cohomology, uh, it, it means this. Actually, here it's hyper cohomology, I should say, because I, I, I have a, a right, uh, sorry, a chain complex and not a sheath. And here, I mean, all these functors are derived. So you should really think of this as a complex. And the left hand side is, 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 is trivial. I mean, it's, it's easy to compute. It will depend just on whether X is equal to Y or not. Uh, and the right hand side is not that difficult to compute uh, a priori because uh, M1, and, and that's the key, M1 is a space that's uh, roughly uh, more or less easy to deal with. It's just a blow up of, of, of a projective space along a curve. So, uh, and, and well, the way you compute these things is um, actually you use Cauchoul resolution. So uh, this uh, Cauchoul resolution uh, of, uh, well, okay, uh, what, what do we have here? We have the, um, uh, the, the, the dual of this, and this map is given by the universal section because this is a moduli space of, uh, you know, pairs with of bundles with a section. Uh, and what that resolves is this PR. So it's a it's a it's a locus that's uh, that that's a projective space, and this is exact. Or if you want to think about it in terms of chain complexes in the drive category, you would be saying that this object is quasi isomorphic, or should I say, isomorphic to the complex that has these three terms. And and if you want to do uh, this uh, tensor product that would mean uh, uh, take this thing, dualize it. Uh, uh, okay, if, if you actually if you if you if you take this and then you uh, you do tensor product with uh, with uh, 
with the same thing, but with Y and dualized, uh, uh, then uh, then the term uh, this term would show up, and then you you have to show you know by means of spectral sequences, you, you, which is just an analogous of short exact sequences. Uh, you you can show that uh, that the 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 homologies are, are what you think. Uh, so that's uh, basically the idea of the proof. So uh, that's how you show that this functor into M1 is fully faithful. But I also told you that um, MI minus one is, uh, the drive category of that is embedded into that of MI. Uh, and uh, so actually you can use that to embed the drive category of C, not just on M1, but it, that, category crosses the wall all the way to M2, M3, and every MI. So you can show this theorem that um, actually for every I, when with this numerical condition, for every I, you have this fully faithful functor, uh, which is defined by the universal bundle on C times MI. Uh, I should say uh, something that, that, that may, uh, uh, that uh, may uh, escape the the eye uh, at first sight is the fact that this uh, bundle is defined on M i right I mean and C times M i so it's the universal bundle for this moduli space so it's not quite uh, it's not quite just like saying okay you have um, embedding on M i and then M i embeds on M two but you also uh, need to make sure that uh, the the functor on M two is 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 this functor that's defined by its universal bundle, not the one on M M one, and and the key is that this is functorially defined. So if you want to compare M one and M two, uh, or M two and M three for that matter, uh, F uh, descends from an object upstairs. Uh, so F on M M1 and the one on M2, they both descend from the same thing. And that's the whole point of windows. You want to compare things that descend from the same thing uh, in, 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 in your different uh, GAT chambers. Now, uh, well, you can actually play a similar game uh, with uh, not just C, but the um, symmetric powers of C. And in order to do that, you have to choose, uh, well, you have to find a bundle that will be sort of the analogous of your, um, uh, you know, uh, universal bundle on C times M. And the way to do that uh, uh, is, uh, well, uh, you uh, consider the, you know, the projections. So uh, you, you, here you have the uh, bundle, well, okay, here times M. You, you have your universal bundle, you pull it back by all the different projections, and then you push it forward uh, to the, uh, via the, um, you know, the, the symmetric quotient and take the invariance, and that's your bundle. So uh, that way you can, you can define a Fourier Mukai functor like this, uh, which by the way, in, the, in this Kyun uh, Li and, uh, and Narasimhan's embedding of the symmetric power, the symmetric square, they use the same kind of bundle. Uh, so, um, well, this, it turns out that this is the right bundle to use. You define your Fourier Mukai functor and, uh, and you can show this theorem that actually you also have an embedding like this. So that's how you embed your um, derived category of your symmetric power of the curve. And, and also that it's not only on uh, M, M alpha, but on M i again by playing this Windows uh, game. So, well, the, again, the, the proof uses uh, this kind of casual resolutions uh, a lot. Uh, well, I mean, I'm sweeping under the rug a lot of things, but uh, these are, I would say, uh, one of some of the most uh, important tools. Um, you also um, want to know that the that when you restrict the fibers, because at the end of the day, you you want to compute cohomology of such stuff on the fibers, and and those are deformations of uh, the um, of just plainly taking the 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 uh, symmetric uh, the uh, tensor product of of each of these fibers, 
and and also as i said uh, you want to use windows so um uh, you want to go from m alpha to m alpha plus one and so on and and you get to the last to the last alpha to, to the last mi uh yeah and, oh and by the way uh, the lock is this map resolves here in this case uh it's kind of interesting that and this is done by thaddeus the lock is that the that the, the, the universal section resolves is also a modular space like this, but with a different bundle, with a twisted bundle. Okay, uh, if you cook up uh, all these techniques and well, play a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cohomology techniques, uh, then you can show uh, the following. So you put together all the blocks and also you use uh, this uh, fully faithfulness of the We'll pull back at this and you get the following. Uh, this is our semi-orthogonal decomposition. As I said, we don't know that this doesn't have a, a semi-orthogonal complement. A priori, it could, although we expect that this should be zero. And these are the, this is how, how we write it. So we have the direct character of a point. Here, here I have the even ones, here I have the odd ones, and then here I have again the even ones, but twisted by a bundle. So they are orthogonal to each, semi orthogonal to each other. And this is what the um, derived category, uh, sorry, the semi orthogonal decomposition looks like. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, what I wanted to say. So uh, thank you. Okay. Let's thank uh, Sebastian. Any questions, comments? Just a quick comment that uh, in the case when uh, this alpha or this uh, category of a curve uh, uh, or uh, category of the zero curve, you know, empty curve, uh, I mean, it's not uh, completely clear that uh, it's enough this to be uh, something associated with. Uh, uh, variety and so that's the i mean let's say smooth projective variety and that's to be the criteria so there are examples when you have uh, trivial intermediate jacobians when the variety is not trivial and so there are examples uh, of conic bundles where the jacob the intermediate jacobian is jacobian of a curve but it's not known if they are rational or not even in the in when the dimension of this intermediate jacobian is two so it's probably something a little bit uh, more complicated, uh, telling you how alpha inter interacts with the rest of the category. So mm -hmm. it's probably a little bit more subtle than just uh, this, what is called Griffith's component. So in the same way as in the classical geometry, the intermediate Jacobian, only in very few cases, is enough to determine rationality. In general, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments or questions? There's something in the chat. Is there a similar progress on the symplectic Fukai category side of this story? Not, not, not that I know of. Uh, well, I mean, we do understand uh, some Landau Ginsburg models, especially if the genus is two. Okay. Uh, I don't know for genus at least three. Yeah, that uh, I mean, so we know what the Landau Ginsburg model is. We, we don't know uh, how to describe the singularities, uh, but actually, you can find uh, the second five where one is certainly a curve and the other is uh, some symmetric power, but it looks like. Uh, something that you can find in the last email I sent you. Maybe. Yeah, also, yeah, for genus, uh, at least three, we don't yet know that this will be full, but... Um, ah. 
we expect that it would be. For well, well, you, we have one yeah, so well, On level of cohomology and motifs, you do know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Motifs, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, Kinsel's work. Other questions or comments? Recording. Sorry, sorry. Oh, God, God, sorry. Yeah, I think good. anyway, there's some. Uh, sorry, sorry. I mean, okay. So for for Kaya category, I mean, there's some conjectural decomposition too. I mean, you know, Fukaya or Fukaya side of Fukaya. I mean, I don't know, but it's, uh, I mean, so when you see the quantum cohomology of this Fukaya, then there's some decomposition like this one. Or the mirror of, the, of these guys. But no, no, once no, again, no. one is uh, semi-orthogonal, another is right, fully right. orthogonal, because Fukaya is being Calabia. Right, but I mean, by your paper with the uh, Orof and Yotof and, yeah, Kapstein, I think uh, there's some kind of uh, dual picture can be ex expected here. And, uh, yeah, yeah, for Fukai side, though, not for Fukai. For Fukai, it, I mean, there is a decomposition, but it's orthogonal, not same orthogonal. No, I mean, yeah, but how can I say? So, uh, in your paper in about this uh, general type, uh, this mirror symmetry of general type, so this is Fano. So, this N is Fano, and C is general type curve. So there's the embedding of a derived category of curve inside derived category of this modular funnel. So according, I think uh, your paper, the Fukaya category of curve can be embedded into this Fukaya category of this module line. Oh. And uh, there is some kind of uh, similar, I, indeed in my paper, I wrote this conjecture, but anyway, it's the Fukaya category has some kind of uh, yeah, yeah. orthogonal decomposition in a similar fashion, and uh, the quantum cohomology has the same decomposition. I, I mean, some cases proven, for, for example, length two case, I think it was proven by, I uh, forgot the name, but anyway, yeah, I, I can give you some reference if you want. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that, that. so I, I think that because these things are conic bundles, uh, a little bit more general approach to Fuka category by Evan Smith applies to this situation. So, because, I mean, he has a general explanation how the curve of degeneration, Fukai of curve of degeneration fully faithfully embeds in the Fukai of the whole thing uh, uh, for conic bundles. And so, since these are conic bundles, that would apply in this, in, uh, that would be uh, applicable to this case. Yeah, I see. I see. I see. Also, by, by the way, the way I write this the composition in four lines, if you look at each line separately, these are actually orthogonal to each other, not between lines, but within each line. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions or comments? Well, let's take a 10 minutes break and next speaker is uh, um, Ogun Skozi. So let's thank Sebastian again.